Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we have a session for about one hour uh, related to the question of the affordability uh, of a number of interventions for households and the role that cash transfers uh, can play uh, in uh, making a number of interventions more affordable. Um, I have a few slides um, to introduce uh, the topic and then we will have our two uh, speakers. Right. I don't know, Kimberly, if we can put out the slides. Oh, thank you. Now, if you look at the terms of reference of this session, uh, we are supposed to find out how to allocate funds to provide maximum benefits to children, families, and communities. So that's a tall order. Um, I don't think we will get there, uh, but hopefully we can provide some. Um, good insights into the role of, of specific programs. So just as a way of introduction, um, I think uh, we believe and I think uh, it, it's true uh, that most uh, parents actually know uh, the value of investing in young children uh, and, and they would really be willing and wanting to do it. Um, and we are actually uh, doing some work uh, on ECD and other topics on, on Uganda. And I thought I would give you uh, these two quotes. Uh, the child who has gone to a preschool can study in primary one, the first year of primary school, with more ease than the other child. And uh, I found the second quote uh, very interesting. Uh, this was uh, a quote uh, from one of the elders in one of the villages uh, talking about um, the qualitative um, um, experts uh, that were doing the field work, uh, comparing his palms uh, to their palms uh, and the fact that um, having access to education uh, really uh, helps you later in, light, in life. Now, parents do want to uh, invest uh, in their children, but often they cannot. Uh, and the cost of services is often very high for them. Um, I give you here a quote uh, about preschools uh, in another of the villages. Uh, Uganda has uh, actually implemented free uh, universal primary education and free uh, universal lower secondary education in public schools, but preschools are not free. Um, and uh, the costs of preschools varies a lot, depending on where you are, but they are privately provided, and that cost is actually too high for most families. Uh, we have to remember, uh, we know, for example, uh, $1.25 a day if we take the World Bank poverty line. Uh, we know that the poor uh, have very low consumption levels. They have actually even lower cash income levels. Many, many of them have very few uh, opportunities of accessing cash income when you are a subsistence farmer. So even fairly low fees can be not affordable for them. Now, uh, much of what we are going to talk about in this session relates to cash transfers, and, and I think all of us are familiar uh, for uh, the impact that these cash transfers, some conditional, some unconditional, have had on increasing uh, the take-up of education and health services among the poor. Uh, Latin America has experienced uh, for more than 10 years now, and in many other countries, uh, demonstrates that. We also are familiar with some of the conceptual advantages uh, of cash transfers uh, in terms of cost effectiveness. They often cost less than providing a transfer in kind, transparency. Uh, sometimes conditionality can help. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I want to remind all of us that, uh, and I think some of our panelists uh, might do too, uh, that even though this session is about cash transfers, it's also very important uh, when we can to provide services for free uh, to uh, families. And here I've just put uh, two examples of fairly successful interventions, at least in terms of increasing take up. Um, when Burundi a few years back made uh, public primary schools free, uh, there was a 20 percentage point increase uh, in enrollment. Now we have to discuss quality and so on. But even though the fees were very, very low, 
uh, making uh, uh, the education free really increased enrollment. The second example um, is about Mali. Um, there is a poster actually outside uh, in the poster room about uh, MUSO, uh, which is a project run by an NGO. Uh, I really like it, uh, that's why I mention it. In three years, they reduced child mortality in their area of intervention by a factor of 10. And what did they do? They did essentially two things. Uh, they relied on a very good uh, network of community health workers who went door to door and checking whether children were sick, helping households uh, do what they have to do uh, to try to reduce um, morbidity and mortality. Um, and they provided access for free when the families needed it uh, to health care in this area. So uh, a reduction in child mortality by a factor of 10 in three years, just stunning. At the same time, and I think some of our panelists will mention that too, um, making things for free uh, for households or available for free is often not enough uh, because you need to have good quality of services as well to have this take up of programs. And the example I'm giving here for Uganda uh, has to do with birth delivery where um, families had to actually pay for just a few dollars but still uh, for a number of things that were used during the process of, of the delivery at the health center. The government made that available for free, it helped, but you still have a very large number of women who don't deliver uh, at the health center for a number of reasons which has to do with the quality of the facilities as well as uh, in some cases tradition. So, um, cash transfers, yes, free services, yes, but also the quality of the services. So we have today, uh, this afternoon, two panelists. Uh, we have Amarjit Sina, uh, who is the Principal Secretary uh, for Social Welfare of the Government of Bihar. And uh, he will talk on two topics. Uh, one is the experience um, of Bihar and India with uh, some of the conditional cash transfers or other uh, services provided uh, for free um, to uh, households and how that helped uh, improve uh, outcomes in a number of areas. He also uh, will talk a little bit about this issue of coordination and uh, between different uh, ministries, uh, different departments uh, to provide services. Uh, I don't know if you saw he asked a question on that uh, earlier uh, in the morning and he will get back with some ideas about how you can actually achieve coordination uh, on the ground. And then we have uh, Lucy Clever, uh, who is an associate professor uh, at Oxford University and the University of Cape Town. And she will talk uh, about uh, some impact evaluation work that she has done uh, on the impact um, of cash transfers uh, on HIV prevention in South Africa. Uh, each of them will have, in principle, seven minutes, uh, although we have two speakers, so maybe they can go a little bit beyond that, um, and then we'll have time for uh, questions. So without further ado, I'm Ajit to you. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Post lunch is always a formidable challenge, and that too, a sumptuous one. I'd only like to say that there is some continuity with the previous session in what I have to say. And I say so because, again, many issues in social development do not lend themselves to very narrow departmentalism or very narrow perspectives of looking at issues. The issue of cash transfers, which I've been asked to speak about, I will come to it. But just as a background, as was clear in the case, which was just being presented by the chair, there is no substitute for good services in human development. Any amount of cash transfers will not improve the health indicators or the education indicators unless and until it is backed by provision of quality services. What we often forget is that if Brazil did what it did, it did so after provision of universal primary education and universally primary health care. Yes, the bones are familiar. Additional disposable incomes in the hands of the poor for conditional cash transfers for ensuring that people seek services 
of a system that is in place. In the absence of a system, I am afraid there are limits to what cash transfers to do. But having said that, there are a few examples that we do need to look at. And in that context, very quickly, from across the sectors, without going into the issues of Uh, very quickly, just uh, these sectors you are familiar with, and I realize that seven minutes is all I have, so one needs to rush through. Clearly, cash is no substitute for provision of basic services, the first point that I made. The rationale, yes, it sounds very attractive, hand money in the hands of the poor for them to decide what they want to do, but again, these are sectors which require the provision of quality services. If in spite of any amount of monies in the hands, in a remote tribal hamlet in Bastar in Chhattisgarh, if the services of a surgeon or a gynecologist or an anesthetist is not there, how do we ensure a safe delivery? I think these are issues we need to look at before considering that this seems the only option. But having said that, there are contributions which it makes, and I think some of the examples I just share with you, one of the major examples has been the one on institutional deliveries, Janani Suraksha Yojana, which was started off on the assumption that demand-side financing will bring more women for institutional deliveries to facilities. Yes, it did bring them to the facilities, but did it necessarily translate into a safe delivery? Did it, ne did it necessarily translate into what we had desired, as studies have revealed, there are issues. While yes, the numbers have gone up substantially, there has been a gain, if you look at purely in terms of institutional deliveries, and especially in states, hitherto so-called the Bimaru states, or states where the indicators were poor, institutional deliveries have gone up between 55 to 70, 80 percent in states like Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Assam. But not all of it translated necessarily into quality services available to women. Now this again one has to visit very cautiously because if JSY were to be launched without the interventions for strengthening public health system under the National Rural Health Mission, perhaps the results would have been even more difficult because unless and until basic provision of services was available, even if demand side financing had brought pregnant women to the facilities, what care could have been provided? So clearly there is a relationship between conditional cash transfer and provision of services. The second sector which I look at, more easier one, and from my state of Bihar, many of you have heard about it, the program of girls getting cycles if they enroll in class 9th. And of course it was extended to boys as well later. What we find on the ground is a real success story. Yes, money in their hands, money for cycles, money for uniforms, money for scholarships. After all, poor families need disposable incomes for their participation to go up in institutions like a school or a health facility. Clearly, higher disposable incomes through cash transfers did facilitate the process. If I look at numbers, in Bihar, my province, 2005, of those who wrote the 10th standard secondary examination board exam, only one-third used to be girls, two-third used to be boys. 2013, that ratio is 56-44, and I can say with reasonable confidence, in the next three years, it will perhaps be closer to 50-50. And among other factors, the provision of additional disposable incomes provision of cycles to be able to reach where they need to go. And it is in this context, on the issue of uh, girls' education, I would like to bring up an issue that I raised in the previous one. When I argued for a common institutional and governance platform for human development, the idea is not to break the compartments as far as allocation of resources are concerned. From my own state, I'd like to give an example related to this, which is making a difference, and that is, Bihar has been the first state to set up a cabinet committee on human development. 
a cabinet committee which has adopted for the state about 16 to 18 indicators drawn from education, health, uh, you know, age at marriage, whichever problems the state has, water and nutrition issues, sanitation issues, those 18 indicators adopted by a cabinet committee on human development are being monitored at all the levels. The ideal situation is that what the state cabinet monitors ought to be what the community monitors at the household level, what the community, the panchayat monitors at the gram panchayat level. The point I was making was, let this institutional arrangement come in, it will save a lot of graft. Today, one problem of overlap which came up in passing the ICBS and the midday meal program. Where is the five-year-old eating his meal? Is it the ICBS center or is it the MDM? Or are both charging for it? Unless and until we create a common platform, we will keep doing silo committees, seven committees to manage seven programs. No community member knows which committee they are on. For effectiveness, you need a platform on human development without sacrificing monies but what that common platform also facilitates is thinking in a different perspective. Let me just share one example related to girls' education. In our state, Bihar, we have very high fertility rates, the highest in the state. And because of that, what is the immediate response? The immediate response is, oh, we need to do much more on population stabilization through family welfare programs. But when you look at the data, what does it tell you? When you look at the SRS data, it tells you that whether it is Bihar or Kerala or Tamil Nadu or, Mad or uh, Karnataka, if girls have enrolled in higher secondary education, fertility rates are below replacement level. If they go up to for secondary education, fertility rates are equal to or below replacement level. Clearly, the answer lay in expansion of educational opportunities for girls. And that is exactly what the state did because it had a common platform. When the Human Development Cabinet Committee met and a presentation was made that look, Bihar and Kerala, if the girls have studied up to class 12, age at marriage is going up, uh, fertility rates are coming up, replacement level fertility is the case in both. So these are the challenges. A lot of the intersectoral thinking and linkage comes in when you work on a common platform. And I think that's the argument I have been trying to make because my view is outcomes can never be fixed unless and until you start working together. Because the way they are interrelated, if a child doesn't do well in school, the teacher will turn around and say, look, the child was malnourished. There is a permanently deep debilitating impact on learning ability of the child. What do I do? And you have no answer. Unless and until a common platform is created, where you actually look at outcomes and where communities discuss outcomes, let us not undervalue the role of the community. Unfortunately, what is happening is, in monitoring pupils' progress in a school, in a lot of other things, our assumption is that parents, will they be able to do it? Yes, they will be able to do it. They know the worth of good education for their children. So what we really need to move towards is a framework where we trust communities with understanding these issues. The last point I'd like to make on this, early childhood development does not lend itself to cash transfers as easily as some of these other sectors do. And I say this because a 0 to 3 age child is a high human intensive support required. For some of my friends here who have seen the work of the Jan Swast Sahyog in Ganyari in Bilaspur, I would advise whoever can visit them to go and see what they are doing. The 56 Pulwaris that they run for the 0 to 6 months to 36 month children, the point that they are trying to make is, in India, at the age of at six months, barely 14 to 15 percent is the level of undernutrition. And you reach 24 months, it reaches 47 percent. After all, what is going wrong there? Are we attending to that? And the answer clearly lies that feeding a child, complementary feeding for a child at that six months to 36 months, is a time consuming process. Mothers who are working as agricultural laborers don't have so much time is a process where a lot of factors with regard to hygiene, health, everything requires a full-time care. So the argument clearly is that mere THRs taken home, take-home rations is no solution for this. And I think when the uh, Inakshi was making the point about investments for children, I for one believe that we have underinvested in the 0 to 3. Our thrust should have been the 0 to 3 if that is where the 
main issue and problem of undernourishment lies. If we are able to respond to that clearly, the results that we'll get at the end of it are going to be very different. And it's highly person intensive. If you meet the Pulwari workers who work there, they get about 3,000 rupees a month. But the kind of service which is expected of them, when you keep 6 month and 36 month children in a center, it means everything. From from their ablutions to everything, whatever is required to be done has to be done by the community worker. It's not an easy process at all. Now, unless and until we realize this balance up to a point. For example, I for one, my personal view is that Janni Suraksha Yojana is no longer required now. If institutional deliveries have become the norm, let that money go into improvement of quality of services. So what is good at one point of time may need modifications and change thereafter. Because it's not all the time that quality services are possible only by transfer of cash. It can work for increasing, enhancing the disposable income through scholarships, money for uniforms, family making a decision with regard to which cycle to buy, all is well. But when it comes to provision of intensive services, we have to get the balance right. Thank you. And sorry for estimating that. I'm too short, I have to move this down. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. And I'm here really to talk about some of the impacts of the investments that we make in early and later childhood on HIV risk behavior and, and other issues in adolescence. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Professor Lorraine Scher. Many of these ideas came about around her kitchen table, eating bagels and drinking tea. But this research is really uh, a set of findings that have come about through a set of discussions with policymakers and programmers. And over the past year, with UNICEF, with UNDP, with colleagues at the World Bank, and with PEPFAR, we've been essentially doing something like a, a sort of social protection and cash transfers world tour, a slightly lower grade world tour. But what, going around and speaking to policymakers in sub Saharan Africa, about the evidence for social protection and what their needs are in terms of research and knowledge. And I, I don't know if it's good or bad, you, you can tell me, but this is certainly research shaped by the demands of policy. Well, this, this study was never meant to be a study of social protection or cash transfers, and, and I was never meant to be studying that. This started off as a longitudinal study of the impacts of family HIV AIDS on children. And essentially what we did was, in South Africa, we selected three provinces. They weren't randomly selected. Governments had a bit of a say in which, which provinces we chose. But within those provinces, we randomly selected one rural and one urban area, big health districts. And within those health districts, we randomly selected census enumeration areas in the urban areas and tribal authority areas in the rural areas. And then within each of those areas, we interviewed every single household with a child aged between 10 and 17. That gave us an initial sample of 6,000. We then ran out of money in one province, but in the other two provinces, we went on and did a longitudinal study with a 97% follow-up rate. That means we think we can be quite, quite, quite robust in saying that, that we've, we've got a good number of, of of the kids followed up, we've got a very good follow-up rate, so we shouldn't have too much attrition bias, and also that we've got something that we hope is at least representative of these very poor areas. I'm happy to answer any other questions about methods that you've got later. But when we were halfway through this study, Rachel Yates at UNICEF cornered me in a corner in Addis, and she said, can you just please look at whether cash transfers are making any difference in HIV risk behavior? They were desperate to know, and they didn't have any evidence. Well, it took about eight months for us to work out how to do this. And eventually, we used propensity score matching, which is a kind of um, way of simulating a randomized control trial. What you do is you, you match participants on, on every other kind of characteristic. We matched on about 300 characteristics, and then you chuck out a whole load that don't match with anyone, and then you look and see whether getting the intervention, which in this case was the child support grant, a small amount of money that the South African government delivers to about 60% of the children in, in South Africa, and see whether that made a difference on sexual risk. Well, the news was mixed, but it was very promising. We found that for girls, Girls receiving a child cash transfer in their family 
had a 50% odds reduction in transactional sex, that's sex in exchange for money or food or school fees, and they had a 70% odds reduction in the risk of age disparate sex, and that's sex with a partner more than five years older than you. These are two massive risks for HIV infection for girls in sub-Saharan Africa. But what's also interesting is what it didn't do. It didn't work at all for boys in terms of HIV risk, and it didn't work on some other sexual risk factors. It didn't change multiple partners, it didn't change unprotected sex, it didn't change sex when you're getting drunk or, or taking drugs. What it seemed to be doing was not changing the kind of stupid stuff teenagers do, but it was allowing teenage girls to make the decisions about who they wanted to have sex with. They weren't needing to have what we call in sub-Saharan Africa a sugar daddy to pay their school fees. Instead, they were able to choose to have sex, even slightly risky sex, with younger boys who were much lower HIV risk for them. But this is, this is all very well, said David Wilson at the World Bank when I, when I spoke about this a, a few months ago in, in Cape Town. But it's not doing enough. And what, what he was thinking was that we should be introducing conditionality. But we also took a step back and said, okay, if cash isn't enough, do we need to be adding something to cash to make it work better? Well, what we ended up finding was the most effective addition to cash was care. And in this case, cash we expanded to include free school feeding, free schools, and food gardens. And care was positive parenting, visiting, home-based visiting, um, school counseling, and um, teacher support. And what we found, and we looked at a whole range of HIV risk factors, we looked at all, all the ones that we'd looked at before, and we found quite different results for boys and girls. For girls, cash alone does reduce your incidence of HIV risk behaviour, but cash plus care has an additional benefit. For boys, to our surprise, cash alone did nothing, just as it did in the previous study, but cash plus care resulted in a 50% odds reduction in HIV risk behaviour incidents. It seems to be that even though the boys in our sample looked like the, you know, they were kind of cool teenagers, they really needed that psychosocial support combined with the, with the basic income in order to reduce their HIV risk. Well, we presented this in Geneva and presented it in Johannesburg, in Nairobi and, and around sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the things that policymakers kept saying to me was, how, how is this working? You know, for them it was a black box. We were telling them, put cash transfers in and get HIV risk reduction out. And so we sat and tried to really work out how, what are the mechanisms by which these, these interventions might be making an effect. And what we found, and this took us months and months because we kept trying things and it, it wasn't making sense. What we found is a very clear set of, of interrupted structural risk. And on, this is a very simplified model. On the left, we have structural deprivation. Now, within that is living in an AIDS-affected family, living in an informal settlement, living in areas of high community violence, and living, um, and living in uh, contexts of extreme hunger. What happens is those go through a set of mediators of increased psychosocial risk. So, um, increased abuse, increased school dropout, increased psychosocial problems and delinquency. And through that leads to HIV risk behaviour. Now, cash and care do interesting things. If you look at the black lines, you can see that they directly reduce the psychosocial risk and the HIV risk behaviour. But if you look at the red lines, you can see that they have what we call a moderative or interactive effect. It means that they work better for the most structurally deprived and they work better for those with the most psychosocial problems. So in a sense, we're seeing partly what, what someone spoke about this morning is reducing the inequalities that these children are starting off with. The last thing, and, and this is work that we're really still going, and, and the, we did the last analyses for these on the plane here from, um, from Dubai to Delhi. But one of the things that has come up repeatedly from UNDP and from other colleagues is the need to understand cash and care within the context of the wider world. Coming from the HIV world, we, we think HIV is, is the sole thing we should be looking at. But as the new sustainable development goals come, and especially from government's points of view, they don't want interventions that just have one hit. They need interventions that are going to have multiple hits across multiple domains of a child's life. 
And we see that for girls, we get reductions in things like pregnancy has a 50% odds reduction for cash alone and a 70% odds reduction for cash and care. But we're also seeing impacts on school dropout. For boys, we see less impacts on sexual risk, but impacts on both school dropout. We see a, a 90% odds reduction with cash and care for school dropout and also on criminal behaviour. That wasn't just delinquency, that was actually criminal acts in adolescence. So how do we think about this in terms of investment in early and later childhood? And this is something I'm still really struggling with. We know, and there's good evidence, that the, the earlier you put in these interventions, the more impact they have. We've seen that not, not only in the great research that's been done on things like parenting programs and cash transfer in Latin America, but also in, in studies done in South Africa, where the earlier the child support grant is, is received, the more HIV risk reduction we see. But we also know that the risk is going up as these, as these children are getting older. And we're also seeing that unless these interventions are sustained, they don't work. When we look at our analyses, time one cash transfers and care does not predict time two outcomes unless the cash and care is sustained across the period. So I think it's a, real, a really big question for us. So what do we know? We know from this that cash plus care can reduce HIV risk and mitigate structural risk. We can also see a range of benefits across different domains. We can see that they need to be sustained in order to work. And I think what's really encouraging about this, this is not a randomized control trial. It's, it's not that level of quality of evidence. What it is is something that shows us that what's really happening, government, cash transfers, NGO programs, family support, with all the mess of the real world of sub-Saharan Africa, is really working. Thank you. I think uh, an interesting theme that came from both the presentations was, yes, there's a role for private investments, which really around strengthening existing public systems, that you can't really create parallel infrastructures. It's more about working within the system, strengthening it, and then you know, maybe looking at scaling up. Um, so I'd love to open the floor for discussion now, first to the forum members and then to the general audience. Questions? Uh, thank you very much for that session, it was really interesting. I think I just want to place on record that we should really try and ensure that when we're talking about parenting, we do mean both parents. And we keep talking about mothers and what we should do for mothers. Uh, fathers matter. Depressed fathers affect child development and child outcome. Fathers are involved in every element. And we, at our peril, will try, uh, try and stride forward in early child development and leave behind 50% of the um, resources that children have. So just to keep remembering, we should use paternal parent rather than just focusing on mothers. Great. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And I'm particularly interested in the South African service experience and exciting and how to build up a funding model and get the government to buy in. And obviously it's not as much a tough job to getting the trust of the treasury. Maybe you could like to enlighten your experience how to build the trust so they're willing to work with you and, and how to build a model into the, the treasury, the national budgeting, and that is uh, not an easy part, and your experience will help us a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe just to ask for a, a little bit more elaboration on, on Elifa around a point which I think speaks to the dilemma which was raised this morning, the dilemma that you know, sometimes we have uh, NGO or outside provision and that could actually lead to, to, to non-provision over the long term. And a thought at the time, or something we've worked on in the past, is the way in which you deliver matters. So, you know, governments, you know, 
NGOs can run projects, governments have to run programs. They can't run in the same way. An NGO can just choose to serve a particular area, can choose to serve a particular population, but governments can't do that. And so the way in which you have to provide services in order that the state can take over. Now my understanding of Alifa is Alifa tries to think about that in advance. So they're trying to provide services in a fashion which will allow the state to take over. Because that's in the past proved very successful. You know, the example of, oh, that will be left to the churches and, and such was raised this morning, but much of the education and healthcare system in Africa was built first by the churches and then taken over by the state because the church is planned in the same way as the state did at a population level. Whereas many of the organizations we have now are planning at a much smaller level and in a much different fashion. So maybe to talk a little bit about your experience in doing that. Um, along the same vein as that question, but maybe taking it a little bit further, I guess I wanted to hear a distinction between public financing and public provision. Uh, I can certainly sign up for the case for public, uh, public funding, uh, especially for poor children, uh, but I want to hear from the panel whether you believe that there's also a strong case for public provision. What is that case? Why isn't it sufficient to have public funding that or private provision? Yeah. So we'll take this on first. Okay. Um, this on. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? No. No. No, we have Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you for those questions. So um, the, the, the partnership building aspect of the program is absolutely critical to the entire theory of change, I guess, that we are engaging with here. Um, we are not trying to pilot an initiative. Um, we model and we test and we do it together with government as a critical role player in that process. Um, and so the decision making is set up through a management team who work together on program implementation and on taking decisions with regard to the way the program unfolds on the ground. Um, the, and, and that's at provincial government level. At the same time, the modeling and testing work happens at ward level in communities. So again, that work happens in collaboration with communities. It's around who communities are and what they need. So the drive is from the bottom up. Um, and then it's around the institutionalization of that. Um, so the, really the core of this is relationship. Um, and at the same time, it's through governed by a memorandum of understanding. And in part, we've been able to ride on the back of the huge political interest in ECD in South Africa at the moment. So it's been an open door for us in certain respects, um, which we've really managed to play to our advantage. Um, and so to get um, provincial governments actually to enter into agreements with us um, in which we articulate quite clearly what the elements of programming will be and what the various roles and responsibilities will be. We also talk, we, our model is very specifically around um, initially our engagement will be big but as government um, gets ready to take this over, we begin to phase out. So we have a very definite exit strategy that is put in place at the same time. Um, we are not trying to create government dependence on um, our team at all. Um, it's just the opposite. So I don't know if that helps with your question. And it is difficult. And, and it's difficult around, I mean, we just had elections um, in South Africa. And with a change in government, you have a change in leadership, um, for example, in provincial government. And then um, at the moment in one province where we're implementing, we have had um, suspensions of the, the head of department um, three times in the three years that we've been working there. And each of these um, suspended heads of department are still on suspension. Um, but it, you know, and it's politically motivated. It's not really, um, there's not much more, but we have to work in that context. And that's, that's the thing that we're trying to shift and engage with. And I think that's in part what's really so exciting about this work. Um, and you know, we, we, it's, it's, you, it, it's really, I, I, I say sometimes it's hustling. You, you're working opportunistically. You, you're going where the door opens. You shift, you change direction, and you have to be able to work like that. Um, so I don't know if that in part also answers your question, Chris, about um, the approach that Elitha takes, but it, it's just you know, to say that um, I don't think that government in South Africa can provide all of the services that are needed at this 
point in time to all of the children who are in need, particularly given, I mean, the one province that we are working in has extremely high rates of malnutrition and stunting. Um, and, you know, there, there are great concerns around this. It's not to say that there isn't enough money, and I guess we saw today um, things around increases in, in GDP and so on that could significantly influence um, the way in which government is able to make resourcing available. Um, the South African government does put a lot of money into early childhood development. Um, and so this is not about trying to take over that role either. It's about recognizing that there is need for a system to change, and it's about how do we use the resourcing at our disposal to work catalytically to bring about those kinds of changes um, and to enable a model that will be sustainable and will be scalable um, at the end of the day. I'll only talk about the uh, public provision question that came from you. Um, I believe that public provision can be effective and can be efficient. The question is uh, how to make it in, in the context of a particular country. Uh, I remember um, several years ago I went to a small village called Shivpuri in Bihar and I found that the school was fantastic. Uh, not only were the children uh, learning, in fact we went there, reached there at night and there was a whole bunch of girls uh, sitting down and studying. And this was a school from first to tenth grade. And I said, but you have only grant for the eighth grade. They said, well, the rest of the money the community has put in. What essentially happened there was the government had a very loose control. Uh, or in fact, the government had not appointed enough teachers. But there was one community leader there uh, who decided that he's going to take charge. And he took charge and uh, started getting contributions from uh, people from his village who had gone and started working outside and so on and he actually took charge and built the school. It became a community school. I think the problem with public provision happens when there is uh, the problems of centralization. That there's somebody far away sitting and making a decision on what you're going to get and what you're going to do and how you're going to do it with very little freedom. And, and, and that comes from a lack of trust that if I give you a bag of money, you're not likely to use it for a good purpose. You're most likely going to use it for a bad purpose. So how do you decentralize? And there are government systems in India, uh, in education, that work very well uh, within the, uh, whatever the framework of whatever well good education is. So it's not that it can't be done, it can be done, but you have to be able to decentralize and that decentralization has to be done with wide open eyes uh, and, and so many. So it's a matter of reform, it can be done. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I didn't say it I suppose, but uh, it, if it's, the thought is out there that public funding and private service is the only option, I don't think that is true. Because we've seen enough examples of private uh, execution that is not good or not, not good enough, uh, given whatever. So I think the key is decentralization uh, and, and allowing that freedom to operate with the strength and the capabilities to run a system. I think that can be done. And that is where uh, non-governmental, I'm not saying private as an in industry, business or uh, NGOs, and it could be just about individuals as well, who can come forward and say, I will run this. Uh, it's possible to do. In the Indian case, uh, the midday meal scheme, interestingly, there was, there was a dilemma whether the midday meal should be provided by a local cook, uh, hot cooked meals. And there are several companies that have come forward, foundations that have come forward, and they're providing uh, 80,000, 100,000 meals a day uh, with a most magnificent uh, clean kitchen. And these meals go all over the place. And they're showing how meals can be given. Of course, they are doing some value addition as well. So I think there are a lot of opportunities to explore this kind of a partnership. Uh, but that is not... We might find all uh, private agencies going for health or ignoring ECD or going into education. So some kind of uh, regulation, guidelines and also standards to be maintained so that the disparity that you were talking of when you have private investments coming into a uh, public uh, service, that can also be reduced. Uh, my question is to, is to, uh, question is to Sherry. Um, what has been the most uh, difficult part of this project in terms of friction with the government? And 
trying to harmonize systems and human resources. This is because we've been trying in India to do this kind of uh, integration with the government to, to kind of um, have a more efficient fund flow system in terms of service delivery for the last three, four years and we've been doing surveys. And it's somehow getting stuck in uh, not moving that, that far. So I would like to know what has been your learning from your experience. The lady, yeah. I am Lenny Chaudhary, I am from the Narutam Sekhsarya Foundation, a grant making organization based in Maharashtra. Well, I don't have a question, just a comment on uh, the ways of private sector's investment. Well, I can't talk about the private sector as a collective, but for individual foundations and organizations which have modest resources, uh, strategic investment is crucial. And one of the things which we have learned in past few years of experience is that uh, investment in community processes uh, through which community can engage better in better implementation and delivery of services and in and finally lead to better community based monitoring demanding for accountability and transparency of public service delivery is an important way in which private sector can invest sure. we'll take one more question Thank you very much. I'm Florence Bangana from Makere University. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Chavan brought up the issue of um, the community school that he mentioned because my question was for the very poor areas, very poor geographical areas, very often private investors don't want to go there and at the same time they are the same areas with very low investment in the public sector and so I don't know whether there are any other examples where, um, com where communities have come together and worked in partnership with others, maybe the public sector, maybe other investors. I know that in Burundi they did that for ECD and maybe Quentin could talk to that but they did it and it started off as a small World Bank project but which was then taken up by the whole country, scaled up to cover the whole country but are there any other examples that we could learn from? So we'll take this round first. Uh, uh, um, I specifically, I was asked this question about the CSR thing. Um, I'm not sure you can and you should direct CSR funding saying that so much percent uh, to go to ECD, uh, not right away anyway. Um, I think the bigger problem in that is that, I mean, if, if you go and persuade a corporate sector, uh, a business that this is where your money will make the most impact and they should be able to come out and do it. The bigger problem is the obstacle of in my backyard and I think it's formalized by the CSR law in to some extent. People think that if you have a plant or a factory or office somewhere then you should be developing the area around it and that's a very myopic view of things and I think they should be looking at uh, and this is where the CSR money should be encouraged to work with governments to make things better, to work better and if that is done then the, if they improve the health system, it's going to have some, some implications to what's happening in early childhood care, I hope. So there are, there's, there's a lot that can be done around there. But I think the corporate social responsibility law doesn't specifically say that. It says you do a design, you evaluate, and you get it done. And government did not want to be a part of it, uh, except for saying that, have you done it? And if you have not done it, declare that you have not done it and why. So I think what has happened is you've taken the first step. Let it evolve. We, when we talk to people who come with corporate social responsibility uh, proposals to us or when we talk to others, um, we try to make this point that why don't you work with us and let's work together with the government to improve something. And I think the response is quite good. Once, once you convince them that this is possible, uh, the response is quite good. That is the direction perhaps that we should be going into. Okay, the question about barriers and, and challenges. Um, I think the one thing that is a strength for Elifa is that it is a donor partnership. Um, resourcing opens doors. And so we have been able, I guess, um, constructively to use the fact that we have resources and that we can bring resources to um, the situation. So that's the one um, 
door opener. Um, in terms of um, the, the barriers, I mean, they're numerous. Um, <laughs> and I was just trying to think which has been the, the worst, but I, I can't think of, of one in particular. I mean, I think they relate particularly to, uh, one of the things on the slide I said was ELIFA is a political activity um, with a small p. And I think a lot of the challenges do relate to politics. Um, and whether they're the politics of compliance or non-compliance within a system, um, whether they're about an individual um, and so on. And, you know, we, we have, as I said earlier on, that what's very critical to us is that this is owned um, by our partners and not by us. And, and part of the reason for that is that when there is ownership, then there, then there is take-up, in, in our view. Um, where we see non, this program not being taken up, it's where there are, it's very clear that, that, that the in, initiative isn't owned. Um, and so we're having constantly to work with that and to make shifts and to see how we bring um, people to the table. I mean, we just hit a challenge last week with the Treasury work that I was talking about where the case study comes from a particular province. And because the case study was being presented to all of the directors um, and Treasury from all of the provinces, we later heard that that particular province felt that we had singled them out and they were immensely uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, so again, that potentially then is a risk and we are having to do a little bit of problem solving around that and um, what we've done is really use it opportunistically to say, okay, so let's talk again about this partnership and how we can, um, can work this out. But in part, it really is about the strength of the team and them using their skill and intuition and resource to, to engage on an ongoing basis as things emerge. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> We're actually doing well on time, so I can take one more round of questions. Yeah, there, there. Hi, um, I'm Shiva. I'm from Kathmandu, Nepal, UNICEF office. And uh, my question goes to Shelley. Uh, I am really very much interested to hear about the South African experience when you said that South African government has put a lot of money now to the early childhood development. I hope I'm right. Yeah? Okay, so I'm just trying to understand what is it that South African government has been so good? Is it some structural arrangement that has been made there or is it some reform or is it a strong political commitment? Maybe there are some, some two or three special you know, kind of experience that you may have that we can take back at home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this question is from Mr. Chavan. Um, thank you for raising the issue of adolescents. I think that's very critical when we're looking at ECD uh, because they are the next generation of parents. But I, and I'm, I, I'm glad we're talking about boys rather than just girls because that's very critical. But I just wonder when you say that we should be uh, empowering the family to look after children, what happens to the poorest quintile who, have, who are daily wage earners? Uh, what is it that we do to empower them to take good care and stimulation and provide the best potential for the child, uh, given if, if we say that that's the responsibility of the family and not the government? I'd just like to add on to what Venu said, because you were talking about uh, mothers and educating the mothers. When we know that in our rural urban areas, the entire burden of looking after the household, looking after agriculture or going out to work, earning a living, all that comes on the woman. So are we still saying that that child also has to be looked after by the woman? Does she go have uh, the right also to work? Does she go out? And even if you don't talk about the right to work, then you know that it is more of a necessity for the woman to go out and work. So why are we putting this additional workload uh, also only on the mother and not, uh, you know, on the parents or on the family? Okay. You don't want to say okay. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks uh, for a great panel. Um, I think uh, often there's a sense that the, uh, because uh, those of us who got into early childhood development being interested in services and the kinds of programs and those kinds of things, we have a, more of a sense of the heterogeneity of uh, public services and the different layers of governance than of the 
heterogeneity of the private sector and how best to use the private sector at different levels of um, a particular sector. So I think what was useful about the South Africa example for, uh, was that there were efforts both at the level of service provision and then at subnational governance and planning, right? Um, so could, uh, could you perhaps both speak to the level of how you pick particular donors um, and which are the particular kinds of uh, parts of the private sector that are most suited to supporting direct service provision, professional development and training, subnational planning, um, and then I think something that perhaps wasn't talked about as much, but the role of the private sector in national advocacy and uh, work with policymakers, that kind of. Okay, um, the question about um, an example of um, government um, funding for ECD in South Africa. Um, and Chris, you might know the numbers, but there's been a significant increase in, uh, percentage wise in the allocations of, of funding from, from government um, to early childhood development. Um, for example, the per child per day subsidy has gone up um, each year over the past few years in a significant way. However, it's, our, our challenge here is that accessing that per child per day subsidy, as I said earlier, is dependent on registration of a centre. Okay. Um, in other words, we immediately are reducing significantly the number of children who will be able to access that per child per day subsidy. We also are immediately disadvantaging a huge percentage of children, particularly those who come from poverty affected communities, because the centres, if they are going to centres they are attending, are the most likely centres in the country not to be registered. Okay. So in other words, that funding doesn't really, in its current um, way of being dispersed, talk to the poverty affected children in South Africa. It continues to contribute to inequality. Okay, so an area of work for us, therefore, has been to say, how do we change that system to make sure that that money starts reaching the children it needs to reach and is spread in a more equitable manner? The response, for example, to, to continually increase the rate of the subsidy every year also doesn't recognize, again, the extent of the need. We aren't increasing the number of children who are accessing the grant. What we are doing is we are increasing the amount in the grant. doesn't make sense. Okay. So talking to those things are central elements of the work of ELIFA. So we recognize there's a lot of government money. There's been talk here today as well about that government money is only as good as the way in which it is being spent. Is it actually contributing to a better quality of service for more children where they need it most? And the answer to us at this point is no, it isn't. Um, and hence our work in this area. There's also a study that we did on called Follow the Money. And that study really looked at where is funding for early childhood development in South Africa going, where are the blockages, and what are the systems enhancements that are needed to make it more effective. So that was at the core of some of the work that we have now been doing in the most recent um, couple of years. Um, so I hope that that um, helps with that particular question. Um, your question is a big one. <laughs> and um, in, you know, in terms of which donors are most suited, you know, the, it's, which donors are most have most commitment and certainly in South Africa at the moment um, I keep coming back to this there is massive political interest in early childhood development our national development plan has included in it outcomes for early childhood development we've just had a redrafting of early childhood policy um, and, and programming for early childhood development so there's a big drive um, and so it's a big area of interest to donors in South Africa at the moment as well. Um, but that said, what, tend, what we, we find in South Africa is that the donor community that is organized around early childhood development has tended to reflect um, or mirror the sector. So the donor community doesn't necessarily think um, in a forward-looking way about early childhood development at this point in time. Um, and so we have also gotten ourselves involved there in various ways in, in donor forums and so on, trying to look at how can we actually organize um, donor thinking around early childhood development in South Africa in a strategic way. Um, 
So where we might be focusing on systems enhancements and institutional pathing for early childhood development, there is still need for donors to get behind direct service provision. Um, so how do we support um, donors to think through that, for example? Um, so there are various ways which I guess this motivating and, and getting donors. We did a study also last year on the donor community in South Africa and who is contributing what to early childhood development um, and how we can be engaging more critically um, with that donor community. But it, it really is um, an ongoing work um, and you know, I don't know if that, I hope that answers some of what you're asking, um, but it does feel like a big question. Yeah, thank you. So there are two questions uh, which are related. Um, you see, the, when I talked about families uh, uh, being empowered or mothers, fathers being empowered and able to take care of the children, I was basically saying this in one particular context, that what the government or a third party agency is saying, I will take care of your children. The attitude is that they will take care of my children or our children and then you get weaker and weaker in terms of looking after your own children. Who has the primary relationship with the, the, the child? Who feels responsible for the future of the child? The system doesn't. The system is not caring. Now what I'm saying, I'm not saying uh, that a working mother who has to work and do everything should also be looking after the child. Actually she does look after her child or hopefully now more and more men are also going to look after their child. That's what I would like to see. Uh, so the question is not whether either or, that the mother should look after and not the, the uh, caring institution or daycare. Daycare is a necessity, there's no question about it. My only question is, if the daycare is failing and if you've created an illusion that somebody else is going to take care of the child, it's not going to work because the child will fall uh, in between the two and, and nobody is going to care. This is the worry. With fragmentation of the society, with more and more nuclear families coming, there's so many structures, the social structures that are disappearing and the natural social support that the child had, uh, you know, the old times, uh, it's still quoted, it takes a village to uh, educate a child. We've forgotten about that. It's, we are now saying it takes only a school to educate a child. Where is this serious feeling that everybody is responsible? Uh, and, and so that is, the, that is the whole point. Do mothers know what they should, what is good for their children and uh, what should be done? Do fathers know what is good for their children and what should be done? And this is the part that is missing. We are, we are neither teaching health, we are not, not, not teaching responsibility, we are not teaching responsibility to our own parents. I am not talking bring value education. This is practical life skills education that young people must have. Practically, because they are going to face these problems, they are already facing these problems. Um, so that's the extent of what I am saying. Daycare, institutional daycare is a necessity and it has to be done. Only thing is, what do you do when it's not there and what do you do when it's failing? How do you create a structure? Either through a family or through a community. Is it possible? I, at, at, at one point, I crazily suggested at some, in some writing that if a, if a hundred hours of work can give, give a Mandrega, uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act can give hundred days of work, uh, manual labor, then why can't a, a, a new mother or a new father get daily wage for looking after children for the first two or three years? It's a very simple thing. And if, you do, if you don't provide the care, uh, I know some people are going to shake their head and say, here we go again. But actually, if it's a need, maybe you, if you have enough money, you could do that. It need not be done uh, exactly in cash terms. It could be done in some other ways. I don't know. But there has to be a recognition that that child deserves to be cared for. And if you can't provide that care, then come up with a solution. And that's, I think, what the conference is all about. Thank you. Very interesting panel discussion. Hopefully we'll continue the conversation over coffee as well. Thank you.
Sapa is from the Children Investment Fund Foundation. And so I'm happy to introduce her because actually they are helping us a lot at the World Bank on a number of projects. So please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if the post-lunch session was difficult, I think the post-post-lunch is even more difficult. But all I can promise is hopefully lots of interesting discussion and a coffee at the end of the 60 minutes. So we spent the morning talking a lot about the need for financing and uh, you know there was a long discussion about how in India in particular there has been an, a significant increase in public sector funding. Uh, this session is going to focus more on private funding and private sector investments around early childhood uh, development. I think uh, what I want to do is really sort of focus the discussion along two tracks. One is the role for private funding and the second one is around some of the alternative methods for private funding. So when you talk about private funding in uh, ECD, I think uh, there's a lot of potential. Uh, we've seen that you know, year on year there's been significant increase in social sector spending, but, in, but that's still in absolute terms. Uh, you know, I think in terms of need, we still have a long way to go, and there's still a lot of potential for private funds, for private foundations to come in. Uh, what we also recognize is I think we don't want private funding to come in and crowd out public sector funding, but really to act as a catalyst or act as an accelerator to jumpstart you know, certain neglected areas that haven't received adequate attention over the last few years. Uh, in the morning, Pia talked about how, you know, especially ECD seems to be poised at this transition phase where we're making a shift from uh, from successful proofs of concept that now need to be scaled up. And I think this transition phase requires a significant amount of capital investment. And is this a role for the private funds to come in really, you know, support the early infrastructure, support early systems development, uh, look at building out data management systems, quality frameworks, for instance. Is this a role for private funders? I think that's something that we would love to discuss in detail. Uh, the third one is really more around underserved areas. I think in a context like India, which is urbanizing so quickly, you find that a lot of our national programs are still focusing on rural, pro on rural areas. Uh, there has been some shift, I think, you know, with the National Health Mission, for instance, that has uh, integrated rural and urban focus. But in, in, in other national programs like the ICDS, for instance, the Integrated Child Development Services, there's still significant coverage gap as far as the urban poor is concerned. And is this an area for the private sector? In terms of alternative routes to investments, I think, uh, you know, some, some ideas that come to mind. So the first one is really around market-based solutions. You know, can we really create sustainable marketplaces uh, that place children at the center of these products and services? And I think in areas like access to health, for instance, we have some fairly successful models uh, that have, re that have uh, received private sector funding. Um, when you talk about access to medicines, for instance, we find that today there's a lot of investment in research and development by the pharmaceutical industry around medicines for pediatric patients. Can we build similar models around ECD that, that, that use private sector funding? Uh, the second one is really around applying some of traditional financial instruments and funds uh, funding mechanisms to, for social impact. So you have a whole growing body of work around social impact bonds, development impact bonds, uh, their social impact funds. And in fact, uh, one of our panelists will present her case study around a, a very compelling social impact fund that's being uh, you know, run out of South Africa. I think the third one, which is more India-specific, is really around corporate social responsibility, which, you know, again, several of our panelists in the morning have talked about. This is a, a really interesting avenue for private funding in the country. Uh, I think we, there, there needs to be a lot more focus and discussion around how we can, how, is there a role for an aggregator that will actually pull all of the CSR funding that's going to flow and actually channel it to areas that are in need. So with that, I'm going to introduce my two very compelling panelists. We have Sherry Lomoti. Uh, she is the program leader for Ilifa Labantwana. Uh, did I say that right? <laughs> uh, a, a catalytic fund uh, that's focusing on social impact across South Africa. And our second panelist is uh, Madhav Chavan, who's the founder of Pratham, uh, one of the largest non-governmental organizations working in the education space. Uh, among several other things, Pratham is really known for uh, their ASUR report, the annual status of education report that tracks learning outcomes on children uh, on an annual basis. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Sherry first.
Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a PowerPoint, so all you get to see is my face. The choice is you look at me here or look at me there. Um, I can't claim a great deal of knowledge of finance or investment and for that matter I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would say you don't have much knowledge about early childhood development either and which would be a fact. Uh, in my approximately 25 years since I left stopped being a chemistry teacher I have engaged with communities uh, in basic uh, education adult literacy, early childhood education, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things very early I learned is, and I endorse what Amarjit was saying, uh, is that communities are important and you cannot ignore the communities, which is something that I'll pick up on a little later, is that when you challenge communities to create their own services, they do come forward. It's a question of how do you really enable them to do that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, three things. One is the government services part, the second part communities and family, and the third part is about other needs and then related to the role of private funding if at all. First of all I must say I think most people here feel that uh, uh, private funding is no alternative in any way to a substantially increased public spending around the globe for the care of uh, our children. Uh, there's absolutely no question that uh, government funding, public funding is going to be required. Now whether you do it by cash transfers directly, indirectly and all that is a matter of uh, debate. But the bigger problem today is that we don't have enough government spending. And so that needs to be taken care of. I also endorse Amarjeet's point of view that unless you have a an efficient and an effective public service delivery system, all this extra funding is not going to mean much. Uh, money can't buy the kind of quality that you require and I think that's well known. We were seeing that in, in the school education system that very large numbers uh, of, well, a huge amount of funding by what we were doing 10 years ago uh, is available for school education today but that doesn't mean that we're getting the kind of learning outcomes that are required. Of course, there could be debates about what kind of learning outcomes, but I think everybody agrees that the learning outcomes are not good enough, whichever way you look at them. And there are a uh, lot of things that need to be done. What is interesting and scary at the same time is that in India, uh, because, and I, I can't say, it, it's happening in the early childhood uh, care and development area as well, but in it's, the numbers are very clear in primary and upper primary education in India, I'm afraid it's probably true of the rest of the developing world gradually as well, is that today, and we've been watching this move over the last 10 years through our annual status of education report, is that today nearly 35% children of India in the uh, elementary education age group, in spite of the Right to Education Act, go to private schools. Whether you call them shanty schools, bad schools, good schools, but parents have chosen to put their children in those schools and the percentage is extremely high in some states and especially in the urban areas. What this is doing, I, I mean we always knew that the middle classes and the upper classes were send their children to private schools. But this uh, change when you talk about 35 percent it's a huge number. In a state like Uttar Pradesh in the rural areas, villages are divided down the middle. I'm not saying everybody in villages is, is poor, but down the middle along caste lines and 50% children, the percentage of children in Uttar Pradesh rural going to private schools is about 48, 47, 48%, which means every village nearly is divided. I won't uh, elaborate on that too much, I'll run out of time. Where I live now, I've, I've got a little house in Pune, in the area called Banir. Uh, my whole street has something like four or five, five I think, uh, daycare and early child care centers meant for the children of all the middle class young families that have moved there. And they are investing and there are a lot of people around here who are saying that we can invest because those who want to pay and avail of these services will actually create that provision because there is no other alternative. What that is doing, I'm, I'm, 
I'm all for giving good child care to all children. But I think it's deepening and creating a very deep divide. And you've got to think seriously about this. The private investments can, make, can play a very positive role, but they can play a very negative role as well. And I think you've got to be really uh, conscious of the negative role that you could play by doing certain things. It's not about regulation. Uh, how can, you know, there will be all the best private school, um, daycare centers and so on. But this country and, and most developing world, our children, they are in need of protection, of nutrition and good care and, and opportunity to learn. If that is not accepted in practice, then we are in a lot of trouble. Now the question is, can private investment play a role in helping the government services become more effective and efficient? How can that role be played? Uh, and what is the best way of doing it? I think there are several ways. We just heard one uh, way of doing it. And there could be many ways. We've been working with Anganwadis in Bihar, Anganwadis in Delhi, Anganwadis elsewhere, where we send out a volunteer and who tries to help doing things. But that doesn't mean we're fixing the problem. There is a need to uh, create alliances so that the government comes forward and private bodies come forward, private meaning either investors as in money or investors as in talent, and work together. Uh, I don't have a case study to cite, but I think this is easy to do if the government really opens up. And the question is that it not always is ready to do that because of the traditional mistrust between the two. I want to shift gears. All this that we're talking about, I think the underlying uh, uh, feeling, I don't know what the word is, is that all this is about giving institutional care that the government is going to provide or somebody is going to provide that care. And I think in the bargain we lose out completely. I'm not saying everybody is not thinking about it, but what we lose out in, on is the role of the family, mother in particular. And I think there is a, a cause to be made to invest in mothers to be, fathers to be, right from youth. And uh, whatever I heard about the uh, adolescent care and so on, I think that is the part where uh, we, we have not focused. Uh, uh, the child is going to spend maximum amount of time with the mother for s at least the first two or three years before he or she finds a feet and starts running around. So I think what are we going to do and have we done enough to enable the mothers to first of all take care of the children? The government can't say, I will take care of your children and not take care of it and not enable the mother either. I think the first thing is that the parents would like to take care of the, of the child. And what is happening here is institutionally the states have said that they're going to take the responsibility and they're not taking the responsibility. In the bargaining bargain, we are also weakening the primary ownership and support that the child has. And, 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 and I think there is a need to strengthen the family structure, especially the learning of the mother. I'm not using the word training. I don't like that word. But anyway, the learning of, of mothers to be able to take care of their children, whether traditional ways, modern ways, I don't know, but that is something that we are missing, I think, that needs to be taken care of. Finally, I don't know how many minutes I have left, none. Um, finally, I think there are simple things that that my children had that the uh, underprivileged children don't have and it doesn't cost a lot of money. Imagine children getting books every month. One book every month. How much is it going to cost? Uh, toys, are, and it's funny, children like to play with spoons and all kinds of things in the house but you still want to give them toys for some reason. Let's say toys and equipment and if you were to say that we want to give, let's say there are 20 million families who have zero to three year old children in their homes. Just take a number, I could be wrong. Uh, Shiva will probably correct me. So 20 million children, and if you say I'm going to give $10 worth of material every year to this family, you're still talking about only $200 million. And that's not a large sum of money considering what is spent otherwise. So giving children simple things that are in your home, having a literate environment, having some other things in the home, not in a community center, at home, is extremely important for the child. This is something that is also being missed. I hope 
some of you here hear me out, you heard me out, and think about this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, where I come from in South Africa, you would always accompany a greeting with asking people how they are. So I'm going to ask you how are you as well, um, and hopefully, given that it's this late session in, in, in the day, we're all still feeling relatively alert, especially after all the amazing food. Um, but I am the program leader, as has already been mentioned, of an innovation um, for early childhood development in South Africa. And I'm going to just talk to some elements of that innovation that really relate to the funding elements of it um, and what we are trying to do around specifically um, influencing public policy for finance and also um, budgeting processes and trying to bring higher levels of resourcing to early childhood development in the country. Um, so I'm going to just start off just by talking very briefly about two elements of the program itself. The one is that we are engaged very specifically in pushing an agenda for an early, um, an essential package of services for children. I mean, we've heard lots of talk here today already around the issues of integrated service provision um, and so on. And really that's looking at the development continuum from conception through to the entry into formal education and looking at the cross-sector of services that young children need to have access to and their primary caregivers need to give them the best start and the best chance in life. So that's really the basis of, of the intervention. Um, the second thing is that within the South African context, funding for early childhood development in its current form doesn't provide a solid base for uni universal access. That it tends to still be advantaging adv the advantaged and children who really do need access to services the way that the funding models are currently structured are not necessarily facilitating that level of access. So it's into that space that ELIFA um, has been working. Um, so the first thing to say is that ELIFA is a donor collaboration. Essentially three donors in South Africa came together, all of them with a great interest in making a difference to early childhood development and particularly to focus on the 40% of poverty affected children um, growing up in South Africa. So it had a very specific focus and a very specific interest in those children who were most deeply affected by poverty in the population. Um, these three donors and, um, are, one is a, is, a, is a large South African donor called the DG Murray Trust, the other is um, Elma Philanthropies, who you might know, and the third is a, is a national bank, um, First National Bank. Um, and then we, do, we did also at one stage have um, UBS Optimus also as one of the key partners. They've stepped back a little, but they remain engaged um, in the program and are one of the um, founding partners. So these three, I mean, three partners really got together and developed together a strategy for early childhood development. And this donor platform essentially leads and pushes this strategy. Um, so Elisa is an actor in the sector, um, using its resources really to bring change and, to, and those resources are used catalytically. So we look for partnerships both in civil society and in government. Um, the idea of crafting government systems was talked about in the session earlier. At the core of the focus of ELIFA is that government is the primary duty bearer for the provision of early childhood services and that that may be done in various forms of partnership with various players in the sector, but primarily it holds that responsibility. So one of our first things to do is actually to engage directly with government. We have and we are, we are working in modelling and testing um, situations in two provinces in the country and those modelling and testing situations are governed by memorandums of understanding between ourselves and government. We then work around those memorandums of understanding and we bring other partners into this process who then are able to actually act as the service providers. So for example, through the funding we would bring a home visiting program into that province. It would be implemented, but it would be implemented in partnership with government. Um, and really our focus is on enabling the system. How do we institutionalize programs like this so that we can talk directly to the issues of scale? Um, so really the resource base of the program is about creating access and leverage. Um, okay. We have together one fund. We are working on, on one focus. Um, and in South Africa at the moment, we see a huge interest politically in early childhood development. So we know that we are working in a space where we have a window of opportunity. 
Um, within this donor fund, <laughs> there are certain elements, I'm sure those of you who work with donors or who come from the donor community know that it's often governed by lots of issues and challenges around how we are monitoring, how we are evaluating and all of the issues that go with that. And so getting this donor fund actually to run and to work effectively has been in itself a fairly am ambitious initiative. Um, but given that all of them have had this deep commitment to early childhood development, we've managed to make it work. Um, and the idea really is that the fund is able to move quickly. So instead of us thinking months and, and having to prepare reports and get things going, we're able to move the resources relatively quickly once we've identified exactly where there is an area of intervention and once we have a strategic partnership on the ground. Now, see, I have one minute, so I have to move very, very quickly through this because um, I want to just get to some of the interesting things around this. What the partnership has ended up being is quite generative, okay? And um, it's generative in a few ways. The one is that these donor partners have come together. They have all put an additional fairly large sum of money into a pot to make this strategy work and to drive this strategy. They continue to each hold their individual ECD portfolios and continue to fund early childhood development in other areas in the country. So bringing together, in other words, a doubling of funding through, through these organisations to the sector. Um, then the other thing that we are engaged in through the way in which we use the resources that are sitting in, in the ELIFA pot is, I'm, I'm rushing and I want to get to this because I think this is where it, it, it is interesting to the conversations that are happening here, is to increase the flow of funding and the other is through government buy-in to actually increase what government is contributing to early childhood development. So I'll just give you an example of this. Um, in one of the provinces where we are implementing, we have done very specific costing work on what the service provision actually costs. So taking a home visiting program through home visitors at community level to be supporting vulnerable families costs us X amount to get that program going. Um, to run early learning playgroups has cost us X amount. We then use that in our partnership with the Department of Social Development and the, and the Finance Directorate of that department to together prepare the budget bid, which then goes to Treasury. And through that process, we have brought for the first time into that province funding to community-based early childhood development. The challenge around this is that the, the department itself doesn't have the institutional pathway at this point to be able to use that fund effectively. So in other words, it doesn't have an, in, a way of contracting these workers directly to then implement the program. So at the same time as us working with the funding, we work with the system around what are the system changes that need to happen to enable this program to be taken up, to enable the employment of these workers, and then at the same time to be able to use this funding to contract them um, in the right way. So it's a bit of a top and tail um, kind of approach all the time with our eye on the system, but at the same time um, pushing the system to change through the implementation on the ground. There are a couple of other examples like that of, of impact on this work um, and I unfortunately don't have enough time to share all of those with you. But there are a number of our publications that, are in, um, that were sent to you and perhaps I could just say one last one very quickly um, is around um, working directly with Treasury in South Africa. Um, one of the other successes of this program so far has been that um, Funding to children in centres in South Africa comes via a per, per child per day subsidy. Not every child is able to access that subsidy because it isn't, it is, there isn't enough for it to go around for every single child. But in order to access that subsidy, centres have to register. At the moment, that registration process is particularly onerous. There are three levels of registration involving 16 different stages. Um, a study that's included in your pack that we, we did around this was taken on board by National Treasury in South Africa. We were asked to come into conversation with them to talk about how we could enhance the system to begin to overcome some of these barriers to accessing registration and therefore accessing the Pachal per day subsidies. We're currently involved with them on looking at how to refine the system. The processes have now led to bringing together all of the directors of finance from all of the departments of social development to start talking about how to refine this. So these are just some of the ways in which we've used the resourcing that we have at our disposal to demonstrate and model work um, around what is possible and at the same time to use that modelling and testing catalytically to really drive for an increase in funding and resourcing to ECD. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much uh, for the two presentations. Uh, I'll now open the floor for comments, questions, uh, and as has been the practice, start with the forum members first, and then the others. Thank you very much uh, for your presentations. I have a question for our last speaker. Um, this is really impressive work that you are doing as a response to this uh, increase of uh, neurodevelopmental delays. Um, my question is related to what you said about the fact that we don't know yet the causes. And is this part of the way forward? Um, because I link it very much to the cost of inaction in terms of prevention through pregnant mothers and even preventing this in uh, girls and women or men if it is related to genetics, biology or environment. So is this part of the way forward? Thank you. No, we'll take a set of three questions. Thank you. Chris, the, the thing I don't like about working with economists if, no, seriously. What the, the question that I had was, I really liked your idea of, of um, testing multiple interventions simultaneously and also of thinking about the, the, the cost of inaction as we test interventions. Could you give us a sense of how that would look in reality? What kind of research projects would you like to be seeing? How, would you, how do you think that they could be structured or structured differently so that we could get the kind of results that would be more valuable in thinking in, in these ways? Yes, uh, this is a question for the last speaker. If you could clarify a little bit more what, how the budgeting worked in this program and what the how, for example, the unit costs were defined and uh, say a little bit more about the budgeting and financing part of this. Thank you. If we'll just do this, uh, Lorraine, and then I'll come to the side. Uh, Chris, just a, a comment. I, I, f I always found it very inspirational when you talk because you, you have the ability with the idea of a cost of inaction to really shake up governments. Because governments are of the thing, well, we'll do nothing, or we'll delay, or we'll do it, we won't do it until tomorrow. And your argument says doing nothing is really costly. It would be great to have numbers on it, and it also would like to know, is it possible, and I don't understand the models, is it possible to say for how long in action, how do you ratchet up the cost? Because if there's a cost to an action, if you keep still and don't do nothing for a week, a month, a year, or 10 years, is there an exponential rise in the cost to you? So what is your clawback? And I think those would make very powerful political statements saying, you know, having done nothing, this is the cost to you. But if you continue to do nothing, it's going to get bigger and bigger. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, please. Yeah, this is also for Chris. Uh, Chris, I like the, the baking analogy, and I like the vector of outcome. I wanted to ask you what is in your vector, uh, and in particular, what time differentiation? What would be in it a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Okay, and Pia? After this, uh, I'll give a chance for you to respond and then we'll take the second round of questions. Thank you. My question was um, initially sparked by Lucy's presentation and now Chris. And it's open, actually, if I can pose it to everyone in the room, which is how much information needs to be considered when setting priorities. And I think when Lucy told us the story of her data, at every data point we had to ask another set of questions to get more answers. And Chris, you sort of raised the same thing here. And I'm thinking in terms of investment then, at what point can we say now we have sufficient information to make this investment? And, or do we have to continue on with the, with the research question? Can we set a threshold? Chris? Okay, thanks. Uh, lots of great questions. I'll try and be... Um, quite quick in response. In terms of the, the sort of types of research that, that one needs to, to answer these sorts of questions, I mean, the, 
the, the answer is a lot, and then it's going to come full circle to, to uh, Pierre's question about when can, we, when can we say that we know enough to, to, to make decisions. So, I mean, I think there's a number of um, ways in which the, the evidence can, can be improved, and that's starting to look, for example, at combined interventions. So, you know, if we know that certain things are good, but certain things are likely to work much better in combination with other things, then that's one approach to, to having trials which look at combinations of interventions and them on their own. But that's a, a very long way round to go. The other alternative is, you know, we, we have to be very clear that randomized controlled trials, while extremely useful, are also very expensive and actually quite limited. I think we have this view that they are the gold standard of research. Randomized controlled trials only tell you that something worked in some particular place. They work very well for medicine where there's a, generally a very clear biological pathway and you can have an understanding of whether or not that biological pathway will vary by context. But in the types of interventions we're testing where everything interacts with everything else, they actually don't tell you a great deal. They tell you that that intervention worked in that country at that point in time for those children. That's not a really rich data as it's often made out to be. And actually sometimes the older methods of doing the, the econometric work, the, the statistical work to try and unpack the relationships a little bit more uh, is actually a much more useful approach. And also at a point that actually Larry Aber has made in, in the past uh, in work that we've, we've done was that also the need to introduce um, intervention studies which, task, which target particular pathways of impact so that we can start trying to get a better understanding of what exactly is causing it rather than the very blunt tools we, uh, which we, we often um, often use. In terms of the numbers, this, the, the same problem applies. I mean, we, can, we talk about the cost of inaction framework, but context matters so much that you can only really apply the numbers to one particular case. So in, in, the, in the book that we did on the method, we do have six case studies, three from Angola and three from Rwanda, which put numbers to this and put, which fill out the vector of outcomes in, in terms of what we, we thought was important for that, those particular interventions. But those are relevant for those countries. Uh, and how one does that for other countries is what the point was made this morning is that you have to repeat that exercise in order that we have the, the locally relevant information. In terms of what benefits, we like to, I didn't, I just, it was on the slide, but I didn't have time to mention it. We like to think of two sets of outcomes. We, we talk about what, what are the sort of constitutive benefits of interventions and the consequential benefits. And the constitutive benefits are really the reason why you go out to do an intervention. So, for example, reducing maternal mortality, the reason you go out to do that is because women shouldn't die giving, giving birth. That's reason enough. That's what constitutes the reason for the intervention. But there are consequential benefits to that which are also valid in the consideration without with consideration of how much priority should be accorded to that, which don't take away from the fact that the mother is still the constitutive reason. So there are benefits to her children of the mother surviving. There are benefits that those children will lead, have better education in the future and, and contribute to the economy. Those are consequential benefits which flow from that intervention. So some way to distinguish between the reason we do it and the long-term outcomes or the short-term outcomes in different fields. And now what you do then in terms of deciding what to include opens up a big debate about how much you can include. And we try to frame our approach as less value-based, but in fact it's very value-based because we have to decide what goes into that vector. What, what is legitimate to consider when looking at outcomes? And that's actually a, a bigger question and I think one which would, which would take some debate to think about who should be deciding what is relevant when evaluating whether or not one intervention is, um, is, better, than, uh, is better than the other. And then finally, to get to, sort of, to touch on the point of when is there enough information, when, you know, this is a question I battle with myself because I, mean, I would say that you know, there's been enough information for a long time. We know what to do. I mean, people have been bringing up children for quite a long time. Uh, it's been going on a while. Uh, and they generally have figured it out quite well. And, you know, there are countries in this world that have, you know, infant mortality rates of, of 1.6 uh, and have very little or no stunting due to nutritional reasons and have very good child development. We know what to do. That's not the question. The question is, do we do it, do we know how to do it cheaply enough for those who control the purse strings to be happy to spend that money? If we were able to give the resources, if we were willing to spend what it took, we could have dealt with this problem generations ago. This is not a difficult question, how to raise children. The question is, we believe it's valuable. Others do not believe it is as valuable as we do. Therefore, we have to find a way to package it in a cheap form which would allow them to feel comfortable to spend the money to do that. And that then can be addressed in two ways. We can improve the information or we can change or try to change the values of those making the decisions. And so that's where the framing of that information becomes key. How can we get those who control the purse strings to think in the same ways that we can, that we do, so that they have a similar valuing for, the, 
for that. Because, you know, it's almost, you know, not to, you know, our, our dear friend Karl Marx made many mistakes in his, uh, in his thinking, but, you know, he often, he talked about the opiate of the masses being, being the church, but in many ways it's now us, the social scientists. We're trying to find the interventions which are cheap enough to keep those who are oppressed happy enough that they don't do anything radical. <laughs> For my first question, uh, uh, I'd like to say that this is really our program. We didn't really expect that so many children were, would be coming to the child development centers. But then the 2013 survey really opened our eyes to the problem that it's, it's a huge problem because Bangladeshi mothers or fathers, they were ignorant. They thought that this was due to some, um, I mean, supernatural thing or that this and that, but now people are coming up. So prevention approach is also in our mind. Our programs are set for five years. The current program is going to uh, end in 2016, and already we have a design I showed you in my slide, that home visits and positive parenting programs we are already thinking about to prevent this. Uh, prevention is, of course, in our minds. Thank you. And for the other part, the budgeting part, it's a bit complicated. Uh, these sort of program, we have uh, developed this program approach in Bangladesh. We left the projectile approach. So the program approach now runs by the pool fund under uh, the development part of our budget. The pool fund, all the donors, they uh, give their money in the pool fund. We uh, spend the money from our government side, then they reimburse. And so when, <laughs> when they reimburse, we have to go through our accountant general office uh, following all our government financial rules. And that takes time and a lot of red tape activity. But uh, we also have an option of direct project aid. If someone is uh, willing just directly to aid the projects, we have one program right now run by UNICEF. It is the Woman Friendly Hospital Initiative. They are directly uh, giving us the fund and we are giving the SOE to them, not through the government uh, process. So that makes it easier. That's why I'm, I told you that I, we are looking for some more direct donors who can fund us directly and so we can just uh, be accountable to them rather than going through the red tape of our it's a huge process. So what happens is in July we give our uh, fund request and uh, we get the fund in September, October. It's not the donor's uh, fault. It's our fault. The government machinery works like that. So we are trying to solve these issues, but it's going to be hard. So thank you. I, I hope I answered <laughs> your question. Did I? <laughs> Could I satisfy you? or You have to go through our budgeting then. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll open it to the second round of questions. Hi, thanks for the contributions. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about today, I know Chris has some experience with, and that's the potential of simulation models to guide investments. So um, there are simulation models in many other areas of policy uh, that might help us uh, make hard choices uh, under certain assumptions. and. Um, I, uh, anybody on, on the panel, but I know Chris has thought about this especially, do you think that uh, simulation models that are built up off longitudinal developmental data but then allow you to model the potential impact of different types of interventions, I, uh, and this, uh, I'd love you to in part address this in the context of what random assignment evaluations do and don't do. So uh, random assignment evaluations might be able to provide an existence proof about what could happen, but not necessarily then help you uh, simulate what if at different levels of intensity and efficiency you could make that happen at scale, what the returns on it would be. Okay, but at the back, Adish. I think we've been talking about the investment, so I want to raise three things. One, the funds are at time allocated, but there is such a financial flow of the funds is not following any discipline or any regulated process. With a result, many funds, even in the developing countries, 
whether internal funds or given by the developmental agencies, remain unutilized. And I think this, this particular thing has to be flagged that the investment need to be really backed up with good financial discipline. Secondly, what I want to say is that whenever there is a crunch of funds and there is a deficit, the children's program and the ECD programs are the first one which really gets their allocations cut. And I think there should be some kind of non-negotiable policy that children's childhood never comes back and at least in the social sector, anything where children are involved, this kind of funds should not be really cut. These are two points and I think I had one more point. Yes, uh, when we are talking of the result framework, I think normally the targets are only fiscal or physical in terms of achievement of an, any intervention which takes place. We never have really had the qualitative indicators which could really point to the right kind of outcomes which really has to be based on very strong research, input, tools and everything. So I think the whole exercise of investment and result framework must be backed up with a robust kind of research investment so that we could really get the right kind of. Thank you. Okay, you want to ask? Sure. Um, <clears throat> on simulation models, I think simulation models can actually be very useful, but, but also we have to be careful about the, how useful they can be and what they can be useful for. So I'm a fan of them. I mean, I'm I try, trying to, to, uh, to build one at the moment for looking at what is the impact of adult HIV for affected children. Uh, and it's an extremely difficult task for child development because as the, the cake analogy was trying to say, you know, it's a lot to do with what else is there, how things interact with one another. So building a model is incredibly uh, complex task to try and, and, and get that down to a simple enough level that one can understand it in the model. But what I found helpful is a, is a frame for understanding that is to say that the modeling process can be used for two purposes and the balance between those two purposes is perhaps key. It can be used to try and predict the future and it can be used to try and understand the present better. And I don't think we're at the point in understanding of child development that we are very good at predicting the future yet. I think we can work towards that, but we're not very good at that. But trying to build models around child development forces us to interrogate the present in a much more detailed way and forces us to, to re-examine the data that we have in a, in a different way and I think helps us understand the present much better. And I think that can help inform um, policy discussions and research priorities much more in many ways than any prediction, um, any prediction could. And it forces us to ask more of randomised control trials, for example. For us, you know, we don't want to know whether the one arm worked versus the other arm. We want to know for whom did it work? Did it work a lot for some people or did it work a little bit for everybody? Once you start trying to model, you have to be very specific about what you're saying. And so we have to re-analyze that data. And it also wants to say, will that impact be sustained? And I heard that Saving Brains is, is here and, you know, they're looking, revisiting some of these cohorts in the future and saying, well, what, well, what's happening over the longer term? What other outcomes are occurring? Does this thing hold? It forces us to ask a lot more because we need that information if we're going to look at the model. So I think it's a very interesting, but we have to be uh, clear uh, uh, for what purpose. On the issue of funds and, and financial discipline, I think it's, it's, a, it's a critical point. And perhaps for me, one of the most depressing around the issue of child development, because you see these programs, you know, $5 million programs, and if you've ever visited, I don't know whether it's different in India, if you go to many African countries, you find a $5 million uh, program that goes through organization X can replace that with any name of organization. You get to the ground and it's delivered by volunteers and involves no direct resource transfer to any family, any community at all. All of that money is eaten between head office, regional office, and some paid for supervisor who comes to check on what the poor person is doing for the other poor person. For some reason, when you're poor, you have an obligation to other poor people, but when you're rich, you don't have any obligation to poor people. You can leave them to their own devices. But we expect these services to be delivered free at that point and we're not prepared to, to push the resources all the way down, down to that level. So the funding flows get stuck. And so we need to really think about ways in which that funding can get all the way, all the way through. And finally, on the, the sort of first uh, to be chopped of child programs, what we have to think about is the people who are chopping them are people too. So what is their 
thought process that goes through the, what is their understanding of child development that says that's where we cut and why do we disagree and how can we get them to see the light? How can we pull them to our side? How do we get them to understand that it's not a negotiable? But we have to understand what they are thinking about it now and I don't have an answer to that but that's perhaps the question we should be asking. Uh, I want to add some uh, points to uh, that uh, actually all public programs they somehow uh, reflect their uh, political commitment of the, that present political uh, regime who are uh, ruling but if it's for the betterment then it continues. For, uh, if people understand if you can uh, just uh, make people believe that it's for the betterment of their children then it goes on and about the accountability uh, in Bangladesh there is very strict <laughs> now, nowadays uh, we are uh, the donors have uh, introduced a uh, disbursement of accelerated achievements of results we get funds only after we uh, fulfill those um, achievements of the result framework so accountability I think we are trying to ensure as much as uh, possible thank you there's a question at the back. Sorry, it's really not a question but a comment, I think. Uh, what I wanted to say here is like in case when we're talking about financing investments in children, in case of India, at least I can say that we do not even have the data for financing for health care, which is as clear back as 2004-05. Uh, for children, it is even worse. So I think in order to know how much we need, the question that was raised by one of the speakers, the most important thing for us to know first is where is the money coming from, how it is managed and where, what are we spending it on. So all those questions are primary to understanding. So a lot of investments from the private or the public sector needs to go in for this. Thank you. We have more specific sessions on the governance side because this problem of Actually, it, it, it's not a lack of money in many places. In many places it is, but it's a, it's a lack of that money getting to where it's supposed to be. It's not getting to the child. It's not getting to, to family support services. Um, and I think always really when we're talking about financing, we do need to be talking about governance issues as well. It's absolutely brilliant. I would just like to also add a very um, randomized control trial story which is looking at the six to eight age group actually which we haven't talked about um, so far and uh, we, we uh, had a program which demanded a randomized control trial in a very very short time period so we were not because we knew it was premature to do a study like that but it was insisted upon, so it went ahead. Um, showed results that basically, this was in Kenya and Uganda, and showed results that uh, the Kenya program wasn't doing very well and the Uganda program was doing very well, which was completely counterintuitive for us. We, we knew that actually the Kenya program was doing extremely well. Um, then, about six months later, we had it was extraordinarily expensive, this RCT. Um, and then about six months later, we had a couple of uh, qualitative researchers and uh, ECD specialists go in and unpack a lot of what was going on. And that was where we got the learning from. Since then, it has been ready to have a more sophisticated look at it. And, I mean, sure enough, surprise, surprise, as the program became embedded, we were getting the results that we were and that's, that's another piece we need to be very careful of with our research studies, the timing of it. Let's do it when there's actually something that we should be looking at rather than, oh well we've only got to do a grant so we've got to see if you've waved a magic wand and you can change the world. Well, what a waste of money that is. Thank you. I'm Pradyumna from UNICEF. Uh, thank you for the uh, nice uh, I mean, presentations. And we have been hearing from the uh, very uh, modern 
clear that very interesting discussions going on. What I would like to hear from you, is it important to kind of prioritize and package the interventions? For example, the early childhood itself is from pregnancy to eight years, so it's a long range. So, so can we kind of, you know, phase or package the intervention as a specific need of different phases. Pregnancy to two years, we all know that that is the most critical period of life which have, you know, major long-term consequences. So can we package the ECD intervention pregnancy, what are the sectors, two years, what are the sectors, and then what are the other to, you know, eight years. So can we kind of prioritize as the interventions uh, as per the um, specific needs? Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's important to package the interventions. What we have to continue to remember, though, is the single point that changes the child's life. So that we have to be having continuity of services over the life course from adolescence to the early primary but that's what really early childhood development is about. Something Carolyn said, um, so much of our research is impact evaluations without a real understanding of implementation issues. And I think as a community we have to continue to stand for a requirement that we've got to do as implement it so that we understand why we're getting the results we're, we're getting and that we can't be held responsible for development five years after the intervention ends after that intervention. And I think, uh, you know, we're at, we're at risk of having that happen when we expect long-term outcomes of a single year of intervention. I mean, I think I think this speaks to the point I made earlier. Is that you know, we have to be very careful not to portray interventions for for children in in um, as as cheap. It's not cheap to bring up a child anywhere, and children are expensive. What the research shows you have high marginal returns to your investments in for children circumstances. So if you have very little and you get something, you get a big change. Then we start imagining that the fact that we got a big change, that that, that so that it moved in the right direction, um, that it's enough, that it will on services, additional supports, other things to be in place. This fine line from saying that, you know, with a little bit of resources, with a few resources, we can do a great deal. We need to be able to say that to get the resources flowing. Definitely making the argument that all we need is a little bit of resources. So how do we walk that line between saying, actually, we need a lot, but if you give us a little bit for now, we'll make a big difference. And so walking find a very back to this issue of framing and back to this issue of governance, across the messages, I think we are fairly clear what we're trying to say. We're just not very good at saying it very clearly. About the uh, package system that... Um my colleague, you asked. Well, we have an essential services package running in Bangladesh. This is like they have some uh, components, communicable disease control, sanitation, hygiene. This is running. But to give emphasis, emphasis on the uh, MDGs, we have uh, prioritized the child development and uh, EOC, essential obstetric care for the mothers. So just to prioritize, it's better that you have some specific uh, programs too for uh, the, I mean, those are, who are vulnerable and needing. Thanks. You know, uh, maybe I'll just uh, take a minute to, for, the, for the forum members to think about two related questions that always come up in policy dialogues, especially with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, it has to do with this idea of costing. Because before you go and say you need so much money, you have to say how much is it going to cost for a child to be provided these services. And what happens, in, particularly in India, is that yes, you do get some idea of a cost, but then that becomes a national uniform norm that is applied equally across the country. So every child, let me give you a number, we need $100 per year per child. 
So you multiply it by the number of children uh, and say that, okay, that is some kind of an allocation or target for allocation. But what we lose out in this, and this is extremely important and we find this consistently in the area of health as well, is that the cost of providing the services vary across geography. So what it is in New Delhi is very different from what it will be in a tribal area. It varies across communities. It varies across the needs of special needs of children. And so that is always left out in these exercises, uh, this rights perspective or an equity perspective. Uh, so we really need to think of how to bring that into not just a number and therefore so much per child, uh, but to plan for some differentiated uh, needs-based uh, assessment of costs. The second one, which is again a very practical one, especially in a country in, in, like India where you have the union government mobilizing tax resources, as Mr. Bose said, and allocating it to states. Uh, if you have this figure of $100 per child, then some states just don't have the resource mobilization capacity to generate those resources. So how do you ensure some kind of an equalization uh, across states so that the uh, resource poor states also are able to provide some kind of a package with this figure of $100 per child per year? And that brings us into a very tricky position, uh, area of incentives and performance-based uh, state responses because in India, for instance, all the implementation of social sector programs, including ECD, etc., is the responsibility of state governments. So while the financing may come partly from the center, it, there's also this whole issue of the state's contribution and state taking responsibility for implementation. And so how does the central government or the federal government incentivize states uh, so that uh, you don't penalize the non-performing states because there are lots of serious governance issues. Uh, the poor performing states are also ones which have this most serious problems of governance and uh, fiscal management and so on and so forth. You don't want to penalize the children in those states, uh, but at the same time you find yourself in this catch-22, but you keep pouring money into those states, you're also not getting the outcomes. So it's a real problem for policymakers and, and Ministry of Finance people. We still have a couple of minutes to reach 5.30. Uh, yes. Yes, um, I just wanted to uh, point out that I think there are different kinds of uh, results-based financing and budgeting. And one is uh, forward-looking budgeting of um, change in particular per child outcomes, right? The other is that you are financing based on you don't get reimbursed until you show the actual outcome. Um, and there are quite a few examples of each of these in ECD in uh, various countries uh, around the world, including, um, I think, some regions that are less represented here, like Latin America. Um, and I think the link from that to the cost of inaction is this tricky thing that is inherent in ECD. In ECD, you have to wait often a very long time to find the maximum societal savings but the, the rhetoric of the cost of inaction is that the cost of inaction is now. Right now, this is what your society is paying for. And that could actually combine long-term costs with medium and short-term costs in a way that's rhetorically useful, rather than, I think, this inherent problem we have in ECD, which is, well, you're going to find wonderful benefits from investing this amount of your budget in ECD, but it's going to take uh, 18 years to find the effects on high school graduation. Um, it's going to take uh, at least uh, six, seven, eight years to find effects on grade retention. Um, so, so I think uh, the, the link between these issues, because I think results-based budgeting um, and finance has a forward-looking kind of temporal aspect to it, um, as well as one that um, uh, makes you actually look backward. Uh, uh, and those are two really different forms of this, where I think we only heard one example of one type of that. Um, and, and then I think, I think these two themes in the panel are linked because of this, the paradox of how long you have to wait for many of the um, cost savings of ECD to become apparent. Yeah, that's one question. Following up on here. Okay, sorry. And I'd I just like to underscore the dilemma as you posed it. Incentive-based budgeting tends to exacerbate differences between regions in a country because the, the better performing, the ones who are already be better performing get more. Now, one alternative, but it is not really widespread, is the idea that 
a well-performing region or district or jurisdiction uh, gets more autonomy and uh, as an incentive and has more uh, liberty of spending a certain lump sum of money across sectors or services, whereas the ones who are ill-performing will be penalized by losing autonomy and the state, in a matter of speaking, takes over um, and intervenes more directly and says, here is some money and you have to spend it on those services because this is where you are weak. Uh, maybe that's an alternative, but I can't say it's a very widespread practice. All right. Oh, sorry, Vanita, last question. It's uh, time over, but last question. And yeah, um, I've just been reflecting on outcomes with respect to early childhood development. And the nature of outcomes is much more complex than, say, with education or with health, uh, independent of, uh, independently. So uh, when one thinks in terms of the outcomes for early childhood development, they are very interdependent in terms of different uh, sectoral inputs that are going to be responsible for those outcomes. And the financing is always very sectoral. So I mean, there's that dimension of it also, that when, we make, when we're talking about outcome-based financing, we are talking about accountability perhaps, we are talking about uh, a reference point against which we finance on, or, or don't finance, and who do we hold responsible? Because it is, I think it's a very complex uh, kind of a context yeah. in which we have to do this uh, assessment. Good, so that brings us to the end of the session. Let me thank uh, Chris and Ashrafi for two fantastic presentations and the audience for asking very good questions and making this, uh, since I'm moderating, one of the best sessions of the day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.